Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com, RockAuto.com, and State Farm. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Thank you, Alec Webb, and welcome everyone to MotorWeek podcast number 216. And sitting around our t- table at Studio C in MotorWeek World headquarters are road test producer Ben Davis. Hey, guys. Our new over-the-edge reporter, Greg Carlos. That's me. And our assistant road test producer, Kyle Scanlon. Hey there. And we've also got another guest that we'll introduce as we get towards the uh, end of the show. Anyway, we've got a lot to talk about, so let's start right at the top with one of the biggest vehicles we've had in here in quite a while, the 2020 Ram 2500 diesel. 6.7 liter, inline six Cummins diesel. This is not the thousand pound feet of torque model this is the standard one with only 850 pound feet 370 horsepower six speed auto tows almost 20,000 pounds okay you got in it you drove it is it worth all the hype i mean everybody loves cummins diesels how about this latest iteration somebody take over who actually did more driving than Uh, i I did did a decent amount of driving in it and i gotta drop it it was uh I really enjoyed driving it. It was obviously really big, much larger than the... But it like, drives tr- smaller than you think. It does. It really does. It's much more nimble, a lot mm. a lot easier to get around city streets than I honestly imagined. Uh, going through some construction zones on the highway was a little frightening at times when you have Jersey barriers and 18-wheelers three inches from you, you on either side. You drive a full-size pickup truck. I do, I do. But I drive, you know, an F-150. So it was amazing the size difference getting out of the 2500 and getting back into my daily driver. Huh. The only way I equated it was getting out of my F-150 and then getting into a Subaru Outback. It kind of felt around the same <laughs> <laughs> going from the 2500 to the 150. You know, the transformation that Ram has done by targeting first their 1500 and now the heavy duties at personal use buyers is pretty amazing. And you hop in the cabin and you realize they pretty much transferred the 1500 interior into the new heavy duties. It's like it just puts it out of sight. It's so far above any other heavy duty that's out there. You actually enjoy driving it. You know, and it's not just having that monster screen in the middle. It's just the way every, all the controls are placed. Yeah, I can hear some of the um, people kind of groaning at home about these luxury pickup trucks and oh, who really needs them. Well, the fact is people buy them. I mean, yeah, they, they do. The reason that Ram and you know uh, has their um, top of the line models and everybody else is because this is a, what the market wants. People who are successful contractors or you know ranchers, they want something that's luxurious and can haul their horse trailer or whatever it is. And and Ram probably is doing that better than anybody right now with that big screen and but you know, we had, interior. We had the tradesmen. We had their bottom basement model in also. And even though it doesn't have a lot of the, uh, the finer points and certainly doesn't have the big screen and all that, even when you got in that, you just found controls seemed to be placed more so they were user-friendly. Uh, and there wasn't a whole lot of controls, but they were no. user friendly. I like the window cranks in that yeah. tradesman. That was nice. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> something you don't see. First car we've had. First Further to Greg's point, in a while though, with that, uh, you hook up a horse trailer or an offshore boat or something. I mean, these things do lots of work, long hauls, and comfort is king. Yeah. Yeah, in the past, I've always um, – I've not shared everybody's enthusiasm for the Cummins diesel. I've liked a couple, uh, the uh, the uh, GM diesel a little bit more. But I have to admit, this engine was extraordinarily impressive in any way, all way, shape, and form. Yeah, it gets it done. Okay, let's move on to our uh, next vehicle, considerably smaller, the Lincoln Corsair, their new compact uh, Kyle, you've had a chance to drive it. Why don't you tell us a little about it? Yeah, uh, Lincoln was nice enough to bring me out to San Francisco, where we then drove their new five-seater from San Francisco down to Monterey. And the drive was fantastic, and it was really helped to showcase everything that's you know good about the car, going through the winding roads where you really felt that crisp steering you know, really gave you a feel for the road. 
extremely comfortable, all of the amenities, you know, that I was in one of the higher trim levels and I only did drive the 2.3 liter. I didn't get a chance to drive just the two liter, Mm -hmm. but you know, there's plenty of power when you needed it to go up hills, had plenty of space. We had a, you know, one of our camera guys with me and all of our gear, all of our luggage, everything fit perfectly. And there was still room to have three people in the back of the car. So they definitely uh, hit the nail on the head with a comfortable and, um, capable five seater. Do you like the piano key uh, gear shifts? No, <laughs> to be honest. That's uh, the one thing that I'm not a huge fan of. I prefer, you know, actually moving the car into reverse, neutral, yeah. and drive, like an old school automatic transmission. But some people like it, some people don't. Let me ask it another way. Nowadays, it's getting rarer and rarer that we get a vehicle in here, especially a luxury vehicle that's got a proverbial console mm-hmm. shift. When you look at the piano keys versus buttons versus the Honda Acura layout, uh, you know, versus the rotary control. Mm -hmm. How does that rank? Would you rather have something else? If you couldn't have a console shift, do you have any concept of what you would want? Um, I would probably go. I'd probably go with the Honda Acura. What they use for the push really? button. I, something about it. It's just. I feel. I find it. It's a little bit easier. Okay. It's that. Maybe that's just me. But when it comes to all the different ones with the different versions of put button, uh, push button, or the knob, I I really dislike the uh, the knob one. That's. No. I like the detached joystick <laughs> myself. You like the what? How about the detached joystick, like in early Priuses and stuff and Mercedes, oh, really? where it's Very just good. a toggle, but oh, yeah, it still has like a good. pattern on there. How hmm. about uh, voice control? I Alexa, haven't... shift in reverse. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Well, I wonder, has that, has that even... I don't been? think it's quite <laughs> I think gone that's there a little, yet. little, it's a little dangerous on there. I'm, I'm the only one. Uh, most, of us, mm-hmm. most of us have driven, I think all of us have driven the Escape. Mm-hmm. Right? Nope, I haven't. Okay. All right, you haven't. Uh, the Corsair is based on the Escape. I drove them back to back, and the and I found the I'm not I found the Escape sort of like a yawner. It's a nice, reliable, well done, compact SUV that just doesn't light my fire. And I thought that it rides rather stiff for what it is. When I got into the Corsair. You know, I know the fact that they're based on the same architecture, but I just didn't see very many similarities between the two at all. So, uh, again, as we've seen with uh, the Nautilus and uh, the Navigator and uh, everything else that Lincoln's been doing, they've separated themselves from Ford uh, extremely well. Um, I was very impressed with the Corsair. I thought it had good back seat room as well. It did. It had plenty of back seat room, you know, going, getting back there and testing it out. We um – we said pretty much the same thing the last Lincoln we talked yeah. about, that they, they have separated themselves. But the uh, the comment that I remember, uh, Kyle, you made in your first drive review was that it kind of looks like a uh, reminiscent of a Range Rover Sport, which, mm-hmm. uh, you know, in, in the best way possible, yeah. it right. absolutely does. And I think it's it's probably their best looking SUV, maybe. And it, it, I think it, it has is. really good lines. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that the lines are really good on the car. We... Um, as soon as we got back, I got back from driving the Corsair, I hopped in a Q3, an Audi Q3. And I will give Lincoln praise that I felt they were much more on par than any domestic product comparing it to something similar from a German luxury brand that I've ever gotten into before. So. I like that they have names now instead of uh, oh, Alpha gosh, yes. oh, Fantastic. Yep. I think everybody does. Everybody except the marketing people, maybe. (laughs) Okay, let's move on now to a a supercar that's got some super comments uh, coming for it. The 2020 Mercedes AMG GTR and also the GLC. Greg, I'll let you start everything off. Yeah, so these uh, cars kind of went through some minor updates. Now, there is the AMG GTR Pro, which we did not drive, um, but we hopefully will here coming shortly. Um, so the GTR, uh, which is not a Nissan GTR, it's the AMG GT with a space and R, 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 which is like no the, dash, yeah, just a space. It's a very high performance version, four liter twin turbo V8, 577 horsepower, which I just had to re look up because I, you know, I guess under 600 horsepower for a car of this price and this level of performance isn't really that noteworthy but then i'm just something about the 577 horsepower was like wow that's so much power but that's where we are now with, that's with where cars. we are yeah 
Um, zero to 63.5 seconds, um, and we can attest that it can do that very easily with uh, launch control. Um, new stuff, uh, interior-wise, it's redesigned. Um, there's new performance things like AMG Dynamics, which uh, allows you to have a little bit more freedom with traction control. Uh, you already have that y- little yellow knob on the uh, center console, which once you go in and turn off traction, it's not fully off. Then you can literally go up level by level until you feel comfortable. If you can go, if you go over the edge, you can dial it back a little bit. Uh, which you know, I played with a lot. We drove it at uh, Dominion in Spotsylvania, which is a uh, pretty decent track. It uh, you got some speed areas. You got a really fast S bend in the back, which uh, it took me some getting used yeah, to. Because, really hard left hander with a big concrete yeah, wall. Yeah, <laughs> I've I've taken um, some lesser powered cars, and I've also taken the uh, Boxer there, which is a car that I personally can drive to my limits and feel totally comfortable this car has limits far beyond my capabilities so i kind of stepped my way up but by the end of the day i was going faster than i had ever in any other car there and it was responding well i mean that's just how good the car is a lot of there's been a little bit of criticism that with all the updates which primarily as you mentioned were to the suspension that they didn't tinker with the engine at all which to me is not a bad thing but what did how do you feel don't mess with it yeah, that thing has so it's, much it's power, work of so, so fast, and it's just always right there. There's like n- – the lag is imperceptible. If you can find it, you're a much better driver than I am because every corner I came out of – and that's another thing. I just let it shift on its own. I just – I Heresy. Mer- you let Mercedes, the automatic do Mercedes its job. Mercedes-Benz <laughs> does – if I can say something negative, they don't do their paddle shifters right. There's just not the response there that you get in like a Porsche with their PDK or even you know other cars. Um, but I just let it shift on its own. It was fine and uh, truly, truly impressive car around the track as it was before, but now even even more so. But it makes me want to drive that GTR Pro and see just how much faster I can push it. Um, but again, just mid, like minor refreshes, which brings me to the glc which i recently drove in uh in upstate new york which um you might not find surprising but uh it's now their best-selling vehicle Hmm. it's not just their best-selling suv it's it surpassed the c-class maybe about a year ago i mean that's that's not surprising i guess when i say it out loud because everybody drives uh, suvs it's basically the c-class of suv (laughs) yeah but some styling updates standard leds up front they already had leds out back uh new face in the front and rear fascias i should say uh still offers the suv and a coupe which the coupe is a four-door still but it just has that sloped roof roof line in the back New 2-liter I-4 turbo um, engine for the GLC 300, boosting horsepower. It's up 14 to 255. Uh, Inside uh, MBUX, Mercedes-Benz user experience, which we've seen in the GLE Mm -hmm. and the A-Class. And uh, again, it's a really nice system. If you like redundancy, you can do pretty much anything anywhere in the car, whether it be on the steering wheel, the center touchpad, touch screen, and you can use voice control. The problem with that is, is when you're a journalist driving with another journalist in a Mercedes car that is constantly listening to you for when you say Mercedes, <laughs> yeah. it can be a little and disruptive. And it will so, and take it, you to places you never wanted and to go. I mean, literally, any time you say Mercedes, it says, it how can I help up. you? What can you do? And it's like, oh, so we were, we were, we were calling it the, 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 the M word or, you know, like <laughs> we just had to find ways around it. But, I really love this. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, you tell her to take a break for a, <laughs> take 20. Yeah. So, you know, the average person isn't going to be saying Mercedes a million times <laughs> in the car. Um, naturally, What's our name, Mercedes. We got it's very possible. Um, you know, just to finish up, we got into the GLC 63 and G- 63S coupe and SUV, and um, over 500 horsepower in the GLC 63S. I'm getting myself confused here, um, but I gotta say, uh, you know, as nice as a standard GLC drives, I can totally daily drive a uh, AMG version just because that suspension is so, i mean it's it's well, the firm, last don't couple get me wrong. the last couple of uh, amg tweaked cars we got in here were so civilized it was like okay yeah i mean they know. they'll give it even the the gtr um all the notes from the track were you know how how docile it was on acceleration as far as linking hooking up for sure yeah uh the you know 
the uh, the GTR on the street definitely feels like it's too much yeah. for the street, but the GLC on the other hand is just the right amount of performance and comfort. I mean, you, you if you like a sporty drive, you're gonna put up with a stiffer than average suspension, but it is by no means rough on you. It's just that if you have the money. <laughs> and you like going fast. That's probably what you should look at. T. Gray, I'm sorry you're so unenthusiastic about these two cars. <laughs> Does anybody got anything else they want to throw in? Yeah. Oh, boy. I think he – well, this is I turning into the Greg the Carlos show. Everybody. <laughs> now, uh, you know, the, um, the AMG GTR, um, when I drove it, and again, I'm probably the, the least aggressive driver right now uh, on the staff – I was shocked at how civilized you, – you said it may be too much for the streets, but I didn't feel – whoa, that's really good. I didn't feel uncomfortable uh, on the streets. Uh, I thought that it handled very well. The throttle was easy to modulate. Yeah, you're kind of sitting in a little bit of a, uh, a cave, but, you know, the car itself was so – made me feel like I was a, a millionaire driving it around. And you pretty much have to be. You have 208 have be. grand for the one we had. Mm-hmm. All right, let's move on now to our lightning round. Actually, we're going to turn back to uh, um, Greg for some of the comments, but let me uh, read our little paragraph first. Um, Greg was just in L.A., and he was there for the reveal of the first all-electric vehicle from Volvo, and this is under the Volvo brand. Uh, They call it the XC40 Recharge. Uh, It's basically an electric version of their XC40 crossover. Currently, Volvo offers plug-in versions of all of their models. They expect that these plug-ins will make up about 20% of their global sales. Uh, Taking a step further, the Swedish brand says by 2025, 50% of their sales will be fully electric. And by 2040, they want to be climate neutral. Uh, they, they're going to introduce one new all-electric vehicle for the, each of the next five years. Is this a realistic goal? Is it symbolic? Is the market ready for it? That's the question that we wanted to kind of toss around. It looks like all the automakers are heading as fast as they can towards either a plug-in electric or an all-electric world. Is the public ready for it? I mean, when it comes to all electric cars, I don't think it necessarily has to do with the public being ready for it. Is the chart is the charge station uh, market out or, there? Or is, is that the, are the it? governments? Uh, yeah, yeah. Just today, Ford Motor Company announced a, a new aggressive uh, program to put in more chargers. Yeah, because so. I mean, I did. I don't know if any of you saw it on the show or online, I was part of the EV road trip that a bunch of the Motor team did, and. Mm-hmm. You know, getting from charge point to charge point at, at certain times, you know, we were all sweating. We were down to, you know, less than 10 miles until we could get to our next charge point. And almost, you know, all three of our vehicles were down there. So I, having experience, almost having a car die on the side of the road waiting to get to a charge point, I think it's more so based on that than actually the consumers. Uh, there recently was a press kit, a press trip for the uh, new uh, <coughs> Chevrolet Bolt. And apparently quite several of the journalists got stranded on that when they Yikes. ran out of fun. Yeah, the math was a <laughs> A little off and yeah. a lot of cars died on the side of the but, road but we have to face up to the fact that especially in europe and in asia governments have mandated that this is what people will buy it's a different story here in north america clearly so likely we may be at the bottom end of acceptance but let's move away just from uh, pure evs what do you think about plug-in hybrids? Do you think that's where we ought to go, and do you think that's got a better chance of becoming a popular item? I think it's going to be a very long stopgap for us because we're just I, we're going to have to depend on those vehicles that can have that backup, mm-hmm. that uh, internal combustion backup, and ultimately it just makes most Americans feel more comfortable. I mean, there's just a, such a small amount of people who can can a afford an electric car and has the uh, lifestyle that would allow for a car with only so much range and, and things like that. So do you think yeah, that'll, that'll change just if we get more fast chargers out there where you can charge up in about 40 Yeah, range minutes? anxiety will eventually fall away. Um, you know, this is not going to be overnight. That's why I think this whole by 20, 25, 50% of their sales is fully electric vehicles 
is a little bit too lofty, uh, but I don't think it's a bad thing. Well, you gotta probably have, they're looking at their, you know, they're now owned by the uh, Chinese, and they're probably figuring that 50% of the sales will mostly be in China. Right. So, well, that's what they're, you know, they are made it very obvious. They say global sales. Yeah. Right? So you're right. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you know, you got to set some sort of goal like that to get the ball moving. And, and, and uh, Are we all being dragged kicking and screaming into the EV age? <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't necessarily. I'm kicking and streaming. I got plenty of friends who definitely feel like they're getting dragged kicking and streaming into this plug in hybrid or just full electric vehicle market. I don't think any of us would argue that it is probably the future. The question is just how far into the future. I saw a crate electric motor for sale. Wow, um, really? That, it's a drop in crate that you can put into air cooled I've seen a couple of stuff. Those, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, it's for a, a bug? Yeah, there has always been companies that do it, but now you can. Just, just buy the. It, and it looks like a. It looks like a V8 block, and it's got like a little a bunch of cables on top. And to it, make it, it look like, like an engine block. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's pretty quite wild. a few of the EVs that we've had in here have been sort of made to maybe in passing resemble an internal combustion engine. If you get past all the orange high voltage cables and all the plastic covers, yeah, that's the only way you could daily one of those old V dubs. I think it'd be really cool. There we all go. right. Now we've come to a very special and uh, bittersweet part of our program. Uh, Ben Davis here, no relation. I keep saying that over and over again. I know he's very glad of that. (laughs) (laughs) After almost 20 years, or about 20 years. Yeah, it's been uh, almost uh, almost 19. 19, Almost, well, close to 20. Let's round it up. 20 years at Motor Week, Ben is leaving, sort of. He's moving south, but he'll still be working remotely for us because, to be honest with you, it's, he's just too valuable to lose. And I was going to ask if anyone had any stories about Ben they'd like to share. And Ooh. now our special guest I didn't see coming that in sense. from the wings. <laughs> I just want everybody Another to know. Another Motor Week alumni. He is literally like bouncing out of his chair to get over here. <laughs> Joe so I'm just going to get out of the way before I get hurt. <laughs> Joe is, is salivating as he approaches the mic. So, Joe, let me turn over I, this part of the show to you. Hey, Joe. Well, I, I can't do the whole thing myself. But I, I was going to say, when I heard this was Ben's final podcast, I had to come back just to say howdy. And, uh, you know, I was th- we went to lunch earlier today, and I told him if it wasn't for him, I probably would have never wound up at, at Maryland Public Television. So I owe a lot to him, and, uh, gosh, I'm going to miss having him around. I still work here in the building, so we still saw each other, like, every week, still talked about stupid old cars that I like. And I don't know. It's going to be sad around here without without my buddy to chat with. And I know everybody else in the Motor Week team is going to miss him, too. Mm-hmm. I would miss you than, guys, too. More than you can possibly know. I mean, it. Um you have ingrained yourself with the the history of of this series. Most people don't realize that Ben operating behind the scenes as our senior road tester, he has a lot of other duties. And one of the things that Ben has always loved is older cars, like Joe was just talking about. And Ben was the architect of taking our really old road tests, polishing them up, and putting them up on our YouTube channel in our Throwback Thursday segments. And uh, that that act was something that, frankly, no one else on the staff had really thought about doing. Ben went ahead and did it. It was a huge success and continues to be a huge success. So we've made him promise that he will continue to help us out in that vein because, obviously, our YouTube viewers really love it. Yeah, um, and I'll have a lot just, more time to listen to requests and stuff. So, <laughs> so keep them coming in. So Ben and Ben's going to be basically – Available when we do a lot of our track testing. Uh, ben also, along with Greg here, are our two um, most accomplished drone pilots. I expect we'll be uh, calling him to do a little bit of that as well. By most accomplished, that means we've run into the most things with the drones. <laughs> well, I was trying to be kind there. <laughs> we've wrecked the same drones and, yeah. and ultimately repaired them and ultimately had to buy a new one. But <laughs> So you want to take one parting shot? Yeah, well, everybody else that leaves gets to say, like, the the cars that they like the most throughout the years. And, uh, I mean, I'm going to miss everybody here, too. I'll I'll be around more than you think, though, I'm sure. I'll pop in when you're least expecting. And I've left uh, 20 Easter eggs in the offices that you'll find throughout the next couple years as well. (laughs) But uh, real quick, chronologically, I was thinking last night the cars I've most enjoyed. And uh, I think I narrowed it down to seven that I'll run through real quick. 
In a chronological order as best I can. He First was uh, down. He's growing his <laughs> yeah. brain. That's the thing about Ben. He has this memory that is just, I've never seen anything Especially like when it. it comes to cars. Mm-hmm. First was a NB Miata we had, a special edition, burgundy with tan leather and a wood grain wheel. It was the first car I ever took home. <laughs> that thing was awesome. Uh, and I think the next was a Mazda Speed 3 we had at Roebling. And that car was just so balanced. You could oversteer it, understeer it just perfectly, and drift it around every corner cool. you can at full product. That was oh, pretty amazing. It was fantastic. Um, the Ford uh, Boss 302 Mustang in 2013, that car was incredible. Uh, Lotus Evora was one of my all-time favorites at Roebling. Well, I remember watching you drive that one. That was fun. <laughs> yeah, I'd give me a rear-engine car or a mid-engine car like that with yeah, with oversteer tendencies, and I'd just go crazy. Um the uh, Mercedes uh, G550 4x4x4. I love that car. Uh, every 911 I've ever been in. And ultimately, the most sh- shocking amount of fun I had in a car was the Sonic RS. I was hoping you were going to say that, dude. I just saw one the other day. And I was like, I, I mean, I was in any way possible was trying to gesture to this guy of like how much I approved of his car. But, you know, he kept pulling away from me. The Sonic RS having the time of his life. Yeah. A short that is a car and a half, gym. man. It was. So um, besides the cars, you going to miss anything else? Besides the cars, all these guys are all my brothers, John. Yeah. You're you're my dad, no relation. <laughs> but you're my work dad. <laughs> the feeling is mutual. Greg and Joe, these guys are my brothers. And Kyle, he's my stepbrother. Yeah. I'm going to miss your – go ahead, Joe. I was going to say, I'll never forget the day we found the episode that had our first ever Mazda Miata test because the tape was missing. Oh, yeah. And we looked for months – and one day we just opened a random file cabinet, and here it was. I was like, Ben, we found it. <laughs> it was so and we thought it'd go gangbusters retro, but it didn't get that many views. Well, no. go watch it now if you're listening. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to miss two you things. You bought that car, too. I didn't bought you? that car. I owned oh, that wow. car. I had a matching jacket. Um, I had it uh, for <laughs> quite a while. I had the first, one of the first factory hardtops, uh, detachable hardtops, because they weren't available when the car f- first came out. I had that. I sold it to a couple on the eastern shore of Maryland, and I lost complete track of it, but I've still got a few parts hanging around my garage for it. Wow. Um, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to miss your work ethic. Uh, You just always get the job done. I'm going to really miss your imagination. And I'm also going to miss just having another person named Davis around the office. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, sir. (laughs) And with tears in our eyes... And Ben, in our hearts, we're going to end this edition of uh, Motor Week's podcast, number 216. Thanks to Ben, of course, Kyle, Greg, and Joe. Thank you for coming in. Uh, Our audio engineer, Jim Bigwood. Uh, Greg also acts as our podcast producer and our podcast creator, Bob Mixter. For those of you out there uh, that would like to see Motor Week that haven't stumbled upon us after 39 years, go to motorweek.org or pbs.org slash motorweek. Pull down the uh, upper right hand about the show. It'll give you a chance to put in your zip code and find the stations in your area that air us. Uh, In addition to that, you can catch us usually on Tuesday nights, but also other nights on the Motor Trend Cable Network. For all of us at Motor Week, thanks very much for being a part of the MotorWeek family. You've been listening to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by TireRack.com, RockAuto.com, and State Farm. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at MotorWeek.org. And watch MotorWeek television's longest-running automotive magazine series each week on your local PBS station.